Hi, I'm Kay Tai. I'm a professor of neuroscience at MIT. Um, I'm affiliated with the Picower Institute for Learning and Memory and the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences. When I was an MIT undergrad, I, um, I had always been interested in, in psychology. And um, as I learned more, I really wanted to know more than theory. I guess that's how I ended up being really interested in circuits and causal relationships between um, neural activity and behavior and um, how I, I actually ended up in the amygdala because a lot of physiologists are sort of um, more either on the sensory side or in the motor side. I'm sort of in the middle. I'm sort of working on emotion and motivation. What is that that's sort of in the middle and it's sort of a nebulous zone um, for, for a physiologist, uh, systems neuroscientist to be. I guess that's how I came to, to focus on, on emotion and motivation. And then, you know, when I started to ask what I thought were sort of basic questions that there must be a, an answer to, you know, how do we know if something's good or bad? That must be known, right? But actually, you know, given the, the circuits that are involved, it's been very difficult to actually ask that question and, and to have a really comprehensive answer. And so um, looking closer at it, you know, you realize, wow, being able to tell if something's good or bad is pretty important for survival, also pretty important in a lot of psychiatric disease states, and yet we know very little about, about this, this fundamental um, neuroscience question. And so that has just, no, the more I know, the more I realize how, how little we know and how much we don't know. And so um, that has really crystallized my commitment to uh, pursuing this question um, and on a circuit level. You know, why am I interested in these limbic circuits? Um, essentially, the limbic circuits are um, really well evolutionarily conserved from, from mice to rats, cats, monkeys, humans. And so these circuits are what are critical in emotional processing or motivational valence processing. And by valence, I just mean if something is positive or negative. So the limbic circuit involves a number of different brain regions. Um, we focus on a couple of uh, specific circuits. Uh, one, the amygdala. We're very interested in the amygdala because it's sort of this interface between sensory integration and associative learning and, and memory and expression of, of valence, uh, generally speaking, and, and the translation of that information integration into action. And similarly, the dopaminergic system is also um, this hub of, of guiding motivated behaviors in both the amygdala and uh, the ventral tegmental area, a, a, a region that uh, houses a lot of dopamine neurons. Um, both of these regions have been shown to be very important for both uh, behaviors relevant to reward and behaviors uh, relevant to aversion or fear. We've known that the amygdala uh, is a really important region for emotional processing for a very long time. And um, in 1888, I think it was like the first study uh, that, that, that um, described the importance of the amygdala. In the rodent literature, um, fear conditioning was shown to be, um, I guess the amygdala was shown to be critical for fear conditioning, which is essentially associating a tone or some other stimulus that predicts something aversive like a foot shock. That's the classical form of fear conditioning, Pavlovian fear conditioning. And this is just such a robust experimental paradigm that it kind of took over the field. And so everyone thought of the amygdala for a really long time as primarily being a module for fear and fear learning, fear extinction. Um, but it, at the same time, um, the amygdala is all, was also uh, being recognized as being important for um, reward in the drug addiction field. And so these were sort of um, separate fields that were approaching it in different ways. So you know, a, lot of, a lot of the anatomy and physiology and circuit work um, kind of came up through the, the fear um, field, but a lot of the pharmacology and actually human imaging studies also uh, came up through the reward field. So now, now a lot of these perspectives are merging and it's really exciting to think about how one brain region can do all these different things. Hi, my name is Craig Wilds and I'm the lab manager for Professor Ty and this is our laboratory. Um, one of the things we do in the Thai lab is we um, make all our own optic fibers. So basically we take a bunch of different components that are meant for the fiber optic industry and make a chronic implantable optic fiber. I guess the original way of understanding what brain function, how different parts of the brain related to function was just doing lesion studies. Um, you know damaging or aspirating or 
somehow other causing some damage to the brain and then seeing what functions were lost, essentially. Um, of course, you know, I think this is, this is how, this is really what the foundation of the field was built on, but um, there are a lot of caveats. When you lesion a part of the brain, um, now we know, now we think of the brain as, as all these different circuits and all these things connecting long range, short range projections. And so if you lesion a part of the brain, you're inevitably uh, gonna be knocking out a lot of things that are passing through. And also if the lesion, a lesion typically implies that it's permanent, um, then if something is permanent, the brain will compensate. You know, there's plasticity, you know, which is fortunate and it's very adaptive. And so um, recordings, or our way, uh, another very classical math, uh, standard way of, of looking at brain activity in neuroscience, and basically you're just listening to what neurons are doing, um, either when you're looking at what the animal's uh, putting out in terms of behavioral outputs or motor outputs, or if you're looking at what you're presenting the animal in terms of sensory stimuli. But of course, all of these, um, all of the causal manipulations, the lesions and activations, um, they're all, they're all, non-specific and what we know now is that in almost every brain region that's been looked at uh, there are many different types of neurons often in very close proximity uh, with each other that do opposite things and so if you're um, lesioning or pharmacologically treating all of these neurons in the same way then you might be getting these zero sum effects where um, you're you're knocking out two opposing forces and so you might not see as robust of an effect or you might see a lot of non-specific effects. Swiss postdoctoral fellow in the lab of KTI here at MIT. So today we're going to slice uh, the amygdala where there was a viral injection and the ventral hippocampus uh, because we're going to patch cells in the ventral hippocampus and try to understand the input from the amygdala on these cells in the ventral hippocampus. So I'm going to start by uh, extracting the brain with these uh, tools and then I'm going to section the cerebellum of the brain. So here's the brain in a cutting solution that contains high sucrose and low sodium concentration to prevent spiking. And after that, I'm gonna prepare the glue on this little platform so I can attach the brain. I'm gonna pick the brain with these paintbrush and spatula and then put it on the, like first dry it on this uh, filter paper and then put it on the glue wait for 10 seconds for the glue to dry, and then I'm gonna take the platform and put it in the slicing chamber, which contains a cold uh, cutting solution, which has a high osmolarity, and so it's, it prevents um, hyper excitability of the slice, so the cell will be preserved better. And then the vibratome is gonna make its job and slice the, the brain of, for 300 micron slices, and then I'm gonna pick one by one the slices and put them in this uh, water bath so it's warmed up at around 30 degrees and like the um, slices are gonna be there in um, warmer solution and regular solution so the cells are gonna have regular activity in there. Yeah, that's it. So this is a vibratome and we're gonna move the blade, like vibrating to slice. And first we have to go to the region of interest. So I'm, when I'm looking for the slice I'm interested in, I'm just um, like going very fast. And then when I wanna slice the neurons, I wanna patch after, I have to go very slow. So here we are at, our, at the level of the nucleus accumbens, which is the ventral part of this triatom. So it's uh, more anterior to the amygdala, which we want to take some slices, but yeah, we're getting, getting there. So these kind of slices are called ex vivo preparation because we, take the, we extract the slices of the brain and then we record one hour after. So within seven hours. So I'm getting close to the amygdala. So now I'm gonna take, like, start taking good slices. So I'm gonna decrease the speed. So I don't know how close you can see, but here you can see the start of the hippocampus, of the dorsal hippocampus, which is here. 
and then more posterior we're gonna go, more ventral the hippocampus is gonna become, and then that's the slice we're gonna pick. One of the best known optogenetic tools, channel rhodopsin, um, was found in algae. And so algae are these single-celled organisms, you know, this pond scum that you see. And, and somehow these algae know that they need to, I mean, no is a strong word, but without a brain, they, these single-celled organisms uh, propel themselves towards light. And they do that by having an eye spot that is sensitive to blue light. And when, when light hits that, um, that channel, the channel opens and uh, cations are permeable and this causes the membrane to depolarize and the flagella to uh, flap and propel the, the cell in some direction. Um, so I don't know very much about algae, but if you take this algal protein and you clone it and express it into neurons, um, when you depolarize the membrane of a neuron, you get an action potential, which is sort of the, you know, unit of information in the brain. And so um, you can deliver any pattern of light pulses and drive uh, neurons to fire in this pattern. And you can also do this with um, stimulating axon terminals uh, of, of neurons. And uh, we have now a, you know, a beautiful array of optogenetic tools that let you do many different things. Uh, in addition to causing action potentials, you can also inhibit neurons. And so because we have uh, this genetically encodable protein, you can you know, use a promoter or use viral vector strategies to express um, opsins in, in any cell type that you you desire, essentially. And so um, then you can deliver light to um, the part of the circuit that you're interested in manipulating and um, manipulate it to, to get a real-time, very spatially precise and temporally precise uh, manipulation and, and see what the readout is in, in the circuit or in the animal's behavior. So we inject that virus to express uh, channel rhodopsin in the cell body of the, of the neuron. And after five to six weeks, you will have expression of this channel rhodopsin until the terminals, uh, which are in the ventral hippocampus and that we are going to stimulate in the setup. And um, another thing is um, that we fuse the channel rhodopsin with an EYFP reporter, so we are able to see the channel rhodopsin. So here you, you have a slice containing uh, the amygdala, where the injection site was be. So the amygdala would be somewhere here. And here at the top, you can see the dorsal hippocampus. And more, if you slice more posterior, you will see the ventral hippocampus. Here you can see, and that's where we're going to record the cells. So I'm going to take one of the slices containing the ventral hippocampus, and I'm going to bring it under the microscope. And then I'm gonna um, bring, uh, fix the slice down with a harp so it doesn't move around and I can actually go with a micrometer precision and patch a cell. So it's very important that the slice is still. This is kind of what we see. So this is, uh, these are the wires of the harp that are holding the, the brain slice. And here you have the cortex and this is the ventral hippocampus. And this is the pyramidal layer of CA1 uh, where we are recording. And you can see I brought a pipette here. So with uh, this pipette, we're going to record the currents or the voltage of a single neuron. And um, channel rhodopsin is a channel that uh, lets um, positive ions go through. And if you shine light on it, it's going to open so you can uh, trigger currents. So we express this channel rhodopsin in the amygdala neurons, and we are gonna uh, record from postsynaptic cells in the ventral hippocampus. And if you shine light in the ventral hippocampus, the terminals coming from the amygdala to the ventral hippocampus contains channel rhodopsin and are gonna like let calcium uh, and sodium in, and then this is gonna trigger synaptic release, and you can record postsynaptic currents through that. In 2000. Five, I guess, was the first application of um, optogenetics to uh, neurons. And essentially what optogenetics is, is the application of these uh, genetically encodable proteins that are light sensitive. And so one thing that, that I've been interested in for a long time is why 
um, psychiatric disease states have the sort of labels and categorizations and they kind of fall into these boxes. Um, and then research often, funding and then therefore research often happens in these kind of, in my mind, somewhat arbitrary uh, categories. And so um, when you look at disease states, there's, it's not that, it's not these clear boxes or, or categories. You know, um, a lot of, of psychiatric disease states are comorbidly expressed with each other. Um, for example, anxiety and depression are co commonly co-expressed. Substance abuse, individuals with substance abuse are twice as likely to be diagnosed with another um, mental illness, mental health problem, and um, anxiety and autism. So 40% of, of individuals diagnosed with some sort of autism spectrum disorder um, are also co-diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. And so obviously both autism spectrum disorders and anxiety disorders are kind of umbrella terms for a number of different pathologies, but what about um, you know, this patient population that falls in this intersection? Could it be possible? I mean, if you think about perturbations of emotional or motivational processing, that can really be relevant for a lot of different disease states. And so you wonder if there could be certain neural circuit elements that are giving rise to multiple disease states. And so um, following this up, we wanted to look at these basal lateral amygdala inputs to the ventral hippocampus that we'd shown to be important for anxiety-related behaviors and see if they were also um, able to bidirectionally control social interaction. And um, indeed, what we found was that driving uh, BLA to ventral hippocampal projections, which we saw to increase um, anxiety-related behaviors, reduced social interaction. And so that's sort of um, this, I mean, I guess this, this circuit that can control both of these behaviors might in part explain for at least a, a part of this population of, of patients that have both anxiety and autism spectrum disorders, um, <clears throat> what, what could be underlying that comorbidity. So, I mean, that might not be the answer for everybody, of course, and, and in both cases, um, anxiety and social behavioral, um, social interaction related behaviors, um, these, are, these are both things that are gonna be really well conserved and have a lot of redundancy. So there's gonna be multiple circuits that, that contribute to these behaviors. But I think um, it just shows that even though it's a very specific population of synapses, you can imagine what could be downstream what could this specific population of synapses be driving and um, what behaviors are gonna be downstream or uh, of this specific manipulation and where do those circuits diverge or overlap? So I think that's the type of investigation that we're really interested in pursuing. My name is Ada Felix. I'm a research associate here at Kate Thais Laboratory at MIT. And also I'm an incoming graduate student for the fall in 2014. Um, my background, I'm from Puerto Rico and my background is in psychology. Uh, my main curiosity in neuroscience is how to translate behavior into study behavior and how it translates in, in your brain. So what I'm going to show here with this confocal microscope is a um, brain slide of a mouse that was used for to the study of anxiety behaviors and social interaction. We either use CHR2 for activation or channel reduction for activation, uh, or we use MPHR for inhibition. Um, we inject it into the BLA and put the optic fiber to deliver the lie uh, in the case of inhibition, it will be an orange lie, or in the case of activation, it will be a blue lie. Um, this fiber is located into, in, in the ventral hippocampus. So the amygdala has been shown to be very important for anxiety and social interaction, but um, the amygdala projects pretty much everywhere in the brain. Um, so in order to differentiate what uh, each projection of the amygdala does, you need to look at these projections, each of them separately. So the first projector uh, that we try on was the ventral hippocampus. And the reason that we try the ventral hippocampus is like the amygdala is also being shown to be important for anxiety and also for uh, sociability. So Ada and her work showed that um, activating these terminals uh, will increase anxiety-like behaviors. So. What we are, I, my, the, my part of the job was to look at the influence of these terminals in the ventral hippocampus circuit, like how does it influence neuro, neural activity there? So that's why I recorded postsynaptically. Does that make sense? <laughs> so here is the neuron attached. So at the 40X, 
you have the, py the pyramidal layer here, and this is one neuron I patched. So this is the soma, and this is the pipette. I'm like touching the soma. And then um, the pipette internal solution is uh, contains specific concentration of ions that kind of mimic what is inside the cell. And we also add a dye so we can have visual feedback of the cell we patched. And then if we change the filter and shine fluorescent light to see it, that's the cell filled with the dye. But it's basically to locate the cell so we can check after. Uh, after the experiment, I'm going to fix the slice and then uh, we're going to mount it on the slide and look at it in the confocal so to do more uh, precise imaging. And like I'm looking at for five seconds. And how does the signal look like? So here is uh, in current clamp, so we are recording the voltage of the cell. So this is uh, five seconds of stimulation. This is each uh, peak is a laser stimulation, and here is the voltage in the cell. So it's the response of the cell to the light stimulation. So it's the response of a ventral hippocampus neuron to the activation of synapses coming from the amygdala. And if we zoom in, you can see that for every pulses, the neuron is responding and firing. In this case, the neuron is firing multiple action potential. Like this is a laser stimulation of five millisecond, and this is one action potential. And in this case, the neuron is firing multiple action potential for each uh, stimulation. So this activity could also be the reflection of uh, polysynaptic activity. So for example, uh, the terminals, the synapses from the amygdala will activate one cell that will in turn activate the neuron I'm recording. So we wanted to know if the amygdala was doing monosynaptic contact on the neurons we were recording from. So to do that, we applied uh, TTX4IP, uh, which is a block, TTX is a sodium channel blocker. I think you explained that in another lesson. <laughs> and. Um, so it prevents action potential, so it prevents all network activity, and if you have a current, you know it's monosynaptic. So in this case, so if you apply the drug, you wait for the drug to uh, act on the slice and on the cell, so you wait for at least 10 minutes, and then you can record something like that. So you will see, like, there is no action potential anymore. Do you want me to work? But there is still... Um, EPSPs, so excitatory postsynaptic uh, potentials. So this response is monosynaptic. So after knowing that there is um, monosynaptic input on the postsynaptic cell, we wanted to know um, if this is only excitatory or if it's also also recruiting uh, polysynaptic inhibition. So when the cell is uh, in voltage clamp configuration, so we clamp the voltage at minus 70 and then at this uh, voltage, we can record um, excitatory postsynaptic currents, like you can see here. So if you s zoom in here, so this is a single uh, excitatory postsynaptic current, so EPSC. And what is interesting with the voltage clamp configuration is that you can clamp the voltage to different uh, voltages. So if you bring the cell at zero millivolt, which is the reversal of this excitatory current, you can uh, unmask inhibitory current, and then you can see them. So in this case, uh, the voltage is uh, clamped at zero millivolt, and if we're, you record the current, you'll have positive current. And so this is uh, inhibitory currents that are triggered by each light stimulation. So with this experiment, we showed that um, there is monosynaptic excitation on postsynaptic cells, but there is also uh, polysynaptic inhibition on the postsynaptic cell, on the pyramidal neurons of CA1 of the ventral hippocampus. It's very specific. <laughs> but it's there, <laughs> and we showed it. So um, one thing that my lab is really interested in is understanding the, the, the role of specific projections. So the amygdala is a perfect example. How can it do all these different things? How can, um, you know, how can you see plasticity in the amygdala after both a reward-related event and a, a fear-related event? Um, how how can how do, does the brain work this way? Obviously, it leads to such different behavioral out 
outputs that there must be a divergence of these circuits. And so um, um, when I was a postdoc at Stanford with Carl Dysroth, uh, I examined a, a specific projection coming from the basal lateral amygdala, this one part of the amygdala, to another nucleus. And I think that by examining specific projections and getting these really robust behaviors, um, we are showing uh, that neurons with cell bodies in the same region that are intermingled with each other can have these axonal terminations in different downstream targets that have completely opposite uh, effects on behavior. And I think that's what's really exciting, and um, that's what the, the work from my lab has, has shown, um, that essentially basal lateral amygdala projections to the ventral hippocampus have the opposite phenotype in terms of anxiety uh, than basal lateral amygdala projections to the central amygdala. This is how an infected BLA will look like. Uh, so in blue here, we have DAPI, which is a nuclear stainer. So DAPI will stain either neurons or glia. Um, uh, we use it to localize ourselves in terms of the structures and when we are, where we are. So this whole area over here is the BLA. Um, so the green fluorescence is actually channel redoxin. Um, so all these are, uh, this image is actually a 10x image of the whole BLA. Um, so the channel reduction or NPHR, it will take around two to three weeks to express in the cell body, and it will travel through the essence to whatever terminal you're looking at. And it depends on what terminal you're looking at. For example, the ventral hippocampus is very close to the amygdala, so around four weeks I will see expression in the ventral hippocampus. If you're looking for an area like from the amygdala to the prefrontal cortex or something like that, it will probably last six to eight weeks to get there. So the virus travels from the cell's body to the terminals. So this is an example of how the terminals from the BLA will look at would look like in the ventral hippocampus. This is a coronal session of the whole ventral hippocampus area. This is where the fiber used to be. So you see this gliosis over here. It means that the tip of the fiber was located over here. And that means that the colon light will be affecting around this much of tissue. So what we're looking at here is, this is, this is in red, is CFOS. Um, CFOS is known to be a neuronal activation marker um, because this is CHR2 and we are activating, artificially activating these neurons. Uh, the marker that we, I mean, the reason we look at CFOS is because that way we know that our virus is actually working and is activating actual, actual neurons in the terminals. Okay, so what I'm going to show you now is a close-up of infected neurons in the VLA. Um, just because it's very difficult to see if a neuron is infected, just because you see so many fibers. Um, so you need to go closer, at least a 60x, in order to see any, differentiate any cell bodies. So like you see here, you're not gonna see every single neuron infected. Um, you're gonna see some neurons infected. So in the case of NPHR, the virus tend to be a little bit less efficient um, than from the CHR2. The reason I'm not showing you a CHR2 is that it looks massive. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, the, with this one, it's just easier to see the cell body and see how it infects the membrane of the cell. It's just easier to visualize. Um, if I show you a CHF2, it's just a ball of green. <laughs> I think that instead of thinking that, you know, optogenetic 
manipulations or overturning pre-existing studies. I, I wouldn't think of it quite like that. I think, you know, this is just the scientific process. First, you, you need to start with a sledgehammer before you can go to your scalpel. You know, if you're going to chop down a tree, first you start with an axe and then you bring that lumber home before you make it into toothpicks.